Uh, so I'm going to talk to you guys about Mahan. Uh, I'm a person, uh, I like something tactile and historical. I don't like to just talk about theory in the abstract. So when I was talking to Bill about doing this, I thought I'd try to show about Mahan's legacies and influence in Asia, if you will, not just talking about Mahan in a vacuum. Um, I paired Mahan up there with my favorite uh, Asian uh, maritime theorist, K.M. Panikkar, who was an uh, Indian diplomat an academic uh, who was very much inspired by Mahan's work. And I'll kind of weave both of their ideas through the, the thing. As you guys have noticed, I, I don't have a white uniform, right? So I'm not an Navy person, uh, but I like to study maritime issues. My interest in this uh, as a kind of a personal thing comes from two kind of funny uh, little vignettes when I was studying Indian foreign policy. Whenever I started going to India and I started talking to people about strategy or security issues, one of the things that often happened is I would have Indian uh, military officers kind of point their finger in my chest and say, you, you United States, why did you send the USS Enterprise into the Bay of Bengal in 1971? And I was like, well, uh, I wasn't born then, uh, so I didn't do that. Uh, but it was something that, for most Americans, we don't remember sending the carrier battle group into the Bay of Bengal during the 71 war. But almost everybody in the Indian political military establishment remembers this incident they call American gunboat diplomacy. Uh, attempting to sort of uh, fulfill sort of our treaty obligations to Pakistan when India was defeating in a war. The other incident happened a couple years ago when I was doing a project on the Andaman and Nicobar Command. So India, the Indian military has one joint theater command over the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And if you look at this as an armchair geostrategist, it's a very strategic location, right? At the, at the entrance on the Indian Ocean side of the Straits of Malacca. And if you look through the history of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Everybody's interested in this. So the Japanese, when they go into the Indian Ocean in World War II, they seize these islands. Uh, when India was getting independent, the British toyed with the idea of keeping these, kind of like how they kept um, other strategic island points like Ascension and other places. Um, the Pakistanis wanted it. The Indonesians wanted it. There's actually only one power, jokingly, that has never been interested in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and ostensibly that's India. Um, so one of the ironies is, is that the Indian government, the Indian defense establishment, only very belatedly saw the strategic value of these islands that everybody else was interested in. Um, I'm quoting uh, an Indian admiral who told me that. Everybody's been interested in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands except India. So that's kind of my interest and in so how to sea power is viewed in Asia. So this is roughly what I'd like to talk about. I'll introduce sort of Mahan's thinking. Uh, some of his important tridents, you know, Thucydides and Clausewitz have trinities, Mahan has a trident. I'd also like to problematize Mahan a bit and talk about different ways you can interpret Mahan. Um, because I think Mahan often gets stereotyped to very specific things uh, that are not necessarily the only way you can read Mahan. And I'd like to talk about why it is that Mahan and sea power seem to have such a strong legacy in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and I'll talk about three different countries' encounters with sea power Mahan, Japan during sort of the imperial days, and then China and India uh, today, um, if you will. And again, for Mahan, the importance of a government deciding to invest in sea power or not. So that's sort of my game plan. So if we look at Mahan, a little bit on his biography, some of you guys have probably already looked at this uh, in your Makers of Modern Strategy book. Mahan himself, he comes from a kind of military lineage, right? His father was a professor at West Point, who is widely known as being a scholar of the Jomeinian approach to warfare, Dennis Hart Mahan, who you guys were talking about today with Jomeini. And, but for various reasons, Mahan decides to go into the Navy, not into the Army, and he ser serves in the Civil War and has naval patrols after the Civil War. But one of the funny ironies with Mahan is Mahan was not really a great sailor. <laughs> And he wasn't very comfortable in command. He's got a lot of, you can read passages of Mahan writing to people saying, after he got back from a sea duty on, on a ship in the 1870s, he said, boy, I forget what a ghastly place being on a ship is, and, and only an idiot would want to be on one, basically, which is really a strange notion for, an, for a naval officer. But Mahan sort of found his home kind of in the library or in the classroom. So doing research, this is where he felt more comfortable rather than being on naval ships. So he's a very prolific author, the most famous of which is his influence of sea power upon history, which was followed by several different editions looking at sea power and history. And he wrote some 130, 140 various articles and book chapters. He was in many ways kind of like a public intellectual, the same way like today you guys might see these talking heads 
on CNN or BBC or Fox News, people who write about terrorism or geopolitics, you know, like Robert Kaplan or one of these guys. He was a very sought after public intellectual about geopolitics, about international relations, the US role in the world, economics and other things. So a very prolific author. Um, not somebody a little bit more perhaps like how you talked about Jomini today, rather than say Klaus Fitz sort of writing alone and a sort of monkish Junker existence, right? A couple of things that are important here for, for Mahan. Uh, timing is critical for when Mahan is writing. So Mahan is writing at sort of the height of the imperial age, where many countries are looking uh, to, to, to sort of extend their reach to get colonies. Um, and of course for Mahan, sort of great powers and maritime powers, and he's writing when the United States and other countries are looking at the world. So the U.S. has this debate with the closing of the frontier. So the United States reach out into the Pacific. And of course, we have the Spanish-American War and so on. But other countries, Imperial Germany was interested in building a high seas fleet, interested in having colonies, Imperial Japan, and so on. So Mahan was well sought after. The picture here is the USS uh, Iroquois, which is actually a ship that Mahan was on that went to Asia. So Mahan himself spent time in Japan really had a positive impression of what he saw of Japan modernizing uh, in the late 19th century as he was a young officer. So one thing you guys will kick around a lot tomorrow in terms of Mahan's thinking are these six elements of sea power. So the geographical position, physical conformity, and so on and so forth. Mahan was really reflecting, this is an often quoted piece of Mahan's writing. Mahan was really quoting or engaging with a sort of literature about sea power and geography that was very a la mode at the time period. Uh, and so it's talking about what makes a country have strong sea power, right? So obviously for Mahan writing, you can see the characteristics of Great Britain here as the island maritime nation. Um, but I'm gonna kind of problematize that in a second. So he's got the critical elements. One of the things I kind of put up here are these different tridents. So Mahan has sort of three arguments about sea power a political argument that basically maritime affairs have affected history. So you guys saw that in the Peloponnesian War, right? Eventually Sparta had to have naval capacity in order to defeat Athens, right? We're linking with the Spartans. Really key to Mahan, and this is key I think to sea power for a lot of your discussions tomorrow, sea power is more than just navies, right? There's a political economic aspect to sea power. It's more than just gray hold ships with numbers on the sides. It's also about production. It's about shipping, colonies, uh, and then itself, naval supremacy is based upon geographic position, bases, and battle fleets. So he's got these sort of cascading tridents, if you will, of what makes sea power. Three parts are a trident for economy, three parts for naval supremacy, six parts for the element of sea power. This is the interesting part as well here. He's also very interested in the role of the state or the government in deciding to invest in sea power or not. And I would actually argue that's a, a more important argument for Mahan than most people realize. And then he also talks about other tridents as well, geographic nodes, maritime axis. He likes to put things in threes, if you will, so kind of tridents. Um, and you can see the development of this and sort of US foreign policy, naval policy in the early 20th century is the US is looking for coaling stations, for projecting power and getting access to Asia, and also to be able to supply and ostensibly protect our exposed possessions with the Philippines. And as many of you know, the lead up to World War II is this huge debate between the Army and the Navy about how to defend the Philippines and Hawaii and where to defend the Philippines and Hawaii, and so on. However, I want to talk a little bit about different ways you can interpret Mahan. Uh, so the conventional way that we kind of think about Mahan is Mahan is very influenced by Jomini. His dad was a Jomini scholar, and there's a lot of Jominian language in Mahan about principles, about lines of communication, all of these sorts of things. And again, one of the shortcuts for understanding Mahan often is decisive battle and battleships. Navy, navies must invest in battleships, have a decisive naval engagement, big guns, and that's what's gonna get you command of the sea. Many people have also written how scathing Mahan was about guerre de course, right, commerce warfare. Uh, about, you know, that the British were wanting to seek battle, the French were doing uh, guerre de course, attacking commerce, and other trading vessels, and that that was not effective. And of course, there's also this sort of martial imperialist Mahan that you can read in, that kind of hardwiring sort of the, the rise of naval power to great power competition and warfare. And again, you think about that time period in which Mahan was writing uh, imperial age, rising Germany, rising Japan, rising 
other countries clashing against each other, each for their place in the sun. And some more critical writers of Mahan have talked about he was a very, he had very strong evangelical faith. He's living in an imperial age. So many people sort of read, read into Mahan's personality about maybe why he was so Juminian or inflexible or something like that. That's sort of a very conventional reading of Mahan. I think you can actually kind of disagree with most of that when you actually look at Mahan. Um, while Mahan ostensibly read Clausewitz very late in life, uh, later on, not early, um, there's certain Clausewitzian aspects, I would say, to Mahan's thinking. Mahan is very interested in uncertainty in warfare, the same way that Clausewitz was. He was very interested in non-linearity with it. And part of this was his reaction against how he felt the Navy was teaching officers. And you have to contextualize this in the 19th century, this transition from sail to steam, right? The, tech, the technological revolution in navies. He felt, particularly in the US Navy, there was too much emphasis in teaching officers on science and engineering and these things, and not enough on command. And so he really was interested in developing sort of an art of command to deal with the uncertainties of warfare in a similar fashion, I would argue, to Clausewitz's talk about military genius and the need for military genius to deal with the fog and friction of war. The other thing that's interesting with Gerda Kors, if you read Mahan's writing, the primary purpose of the battle fleet, right, is to destroy the other person's battle fleet. But how do you influence events on the ground? And you influence events on the ground by protecting your commerce and threatening your adversary's commerce. Now, Mahan conceptualized this normally as a close blockade of the enemy's shores. So it's not like he was against commerce warfare. At the end of the day for Mahan, maritime commerce and the Navy are intrinsically linked. What he was against was a U.S. conception of gear de course. Right, we have this tradition in the U.S. US uh, maritime thinking in the 19th century. We don't really need like a large navy. We can use the John Paul Jones model of a few privateers to do individual surface raiding. Mahan says that's not going to work. That's not going to work in modern warfare to have sort of hastily converted merchant ships to do surface raiding. And you can think of how quickly in World War II, for example, the British were able to wrap up most of the individual German surface raiders. You know, they only last for about the first six to eight months of the war. Um, Mahan said this is not going to work. So it's a specific type of gear de course that he was against. The other thing that's interesting if you're reading Mahan, you can read a more merchant-oriented Mahan. A Mahan who actually says, this is a quote from Mahan, force is an alien element in maritime commercial intercourse. So Mahan that's interested in trade, interested in the maritime uh, community, sort of even beyond the Navy, if you will. So you can kind of think about different ways to engage with Mahan. Um, this has several sort of implications, right? The conventional way that we look at Mahan is that he's writing about Great Britain. And um, so I get my groove on for you guys. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I, not train of thought there. Um, so one of the conventional ways we look at Mahan is he's writing about Britain and how Britain, the whole thing of the influence of sea power upon history is this great long contest between Britain, France, and Holland for mastery of the seas. And so the conventional way we look at it, well, Britain was an island. It didn't have these continental distractions, so it won out over Holland and France because they had to defend territory and were conflicted. However, I mean, if that's the case, if that's really the argument in Mahan's book, you don't need a book to say that, right? Hey, what do you need for sea power? Just be an island, right? I mean, that's not very helpful for most people, right? Because you can't create yourself as an island. Or maybe the Chinese are in the South China Sea, but anyways. The thing for Mahan is not really the, the six elements of sea power. The thing for Mahan is government choice. Governments who have a choice between investing and in only being a land power or also investing in sea power. So I would flip the influence of sea power in history. The key actor that Mahan is interested in is France. Because France has a lot of material elements that can make it a maritime power, but it also has continental interest. And so Mahan's critical role was how France at some times invested in sea power, but often missed the boat, so to speak, bad pun, uh, about investing in sea power in critical ways. And so Mahan, in writing his book, he's really worried that the US is in an analogous position to France, and it will be too focused on, on, on our, our own region, on the Americas and being a continental power, and we might turn away from the sea. So it's really about government choice for Mahan rather than necessary geographic elements. And many people have written on Mahan have actually said that the whole thing with the six elements of sea power that we often talk about was essentially something forced upon him by his editor, because that's the way people talked about sea power. So he puts it in more as a foil 
if you will, for his larger arguments of a government role. Um, now we're going to kind of switch to where maybe perhaps Asia fits into this, because I haven't talked about that yet. Remember, Mahan is writing in a time period of the rise of empires. So empires start off in the early modern age, right? We've got these empires about 1700. And of course, by the time Mahan's writing, it's the high tide of European empires within the world, and also Japan as well. One of the things that we see here is the high tide of sort of European imperialism coincides with sort of the rise of the West and sort of the decline of the non-Western nations. And so some of you guys who are interested in military history have probably read about the military revolution argument, right? That essentially there's a revolution in military affairs that allows the West to rise and conquer a large parts of the rest of the world, right? The thing that's interesting with this is how this relates then to Asia. So if we think about the decline in Asia during the Imperial Age, I've got a lot of graphics for you. One of the things is before the modern era, China, India tended to be much more wealthy countries than the European countries. But with the sort of European expansion, 1700s, 1800s, you see this huge decline in the share of global GDP by India and China as essentially you see the rise of the West. And almost any way that you can measure this is a very, very drastic decline uh, in Asian wealth and power uh, during this imperial age, right? So you can put it, I've got different slides here that you can look at for decline of China and India. And again, different ways you could look at that. What I'd like to then do now is kind of think about the, the specific sort of encounters these countries had. So here's the Portuguese uh, entering into the Indian Ocean in the early 1500s with Vasco da Gama and Albuquerque. We also have here the British with the Opium Wars in the 1840s, imposing the will upon China. And of course, most famously in sort of our context in the US, the US opening of Japan in 1853 with Commodore Perry. Is there, do you notice like a similarity between the visual representations of these three events? Anybody? Any commonality between all three? I like asking obvious questions. Ships, right? <laughs> and this is, this is kind of like an obvious point, but I think we tend to forget this. European domination of Asia was made possible through sea power, right? That at the end of the day, it's sea power. Uh, and that left a mark in historical memory in many places in Asia. So my good friend, Cam Panikar, who I introduced to you guys earlier, the great Indian historian, he calls this era the Vasco da Gama epoch of Asian history which is essentially the domination of maritime power over land power. Traditionally, most of these Asian states tend to be very land power based, and their security threats tended to be land power based. So you see this domination of Europe through the seas. Uh, and again, he wrote several books about this, uh, and that this is the key to sort of make Western imperialism uh, over Asia work that I think is often kind of missed out when we in the West look at the history of imperialism. Um, I give you a quote by the two navalists over at the uh, Naval War College, Jim Holmes and Toshio Shihara. Control of maritime communications in Asia enabled European conquerors to deprive India of independence in the only time in its history and to have their way with the China in decline and to establish bases and colonies throughout coastal Asia. And again, you can see this, the spread of European colonization and trading posts first in South Asia in the 1500s to the, the 18th century. Uh, also interesting here, yeah, this is a map from my good friend, office mate, Mike Phillips, who's into geography. If you're looking from the sea toward China, right, it's interesting to see how much of China is exposed if you control the maritime domain. And how close a lot of the key points in China are uh, to the ocean. So if you look at the far right here, this part here where I'm kind of putting my, that's Peking, right? That's Beijing. If you're thinking about projecting power from the ocean where China's pretty well defended in a sense of coming in from barbarians, coming in from the hinterlands, if you will, it's fairly open to exploitation from the sea. Some of you guys later on in TSC, I think we'll do the Boxer Rebellion as a case study uh, for combined arms. What's interesting, if you look at Western, uh, Western expeditions to get to Beijing, Second Opium War, the Arrow War, forcing the Taiku forts, going up the river, getting to Beijing. 50 years later, coalition against the boxers, force the Taiku forts go over the river. I mean, virtually the same path for the campaign. Again, maritime based. If we look at a lot of the, the century of shame for China, the period of time period between the Opium Wars and the, the end of the Civil War, 
most, again, the loss of sovereignty for China from the sea. If you look at, we've always, this is a war we don't remember in the West, the Sino-French War between Japan, uh, sorry, between China and Vietnam on the one hand and France on the other, the French military on the ground couldn't defeat the Chinese uh, in the north of Vietnam, but the French Navy could operate with impunity and that's how they won the war. There was just no way for the Chinese to match the French at sea. If you look at the spheres of influence that have these unequal treaties, these violations of Chinese sovereignty, again, tends to be mostly maritime based. Uh, as countries, the Western countries and Japan sort of force themselves in upon China. I love Korea is a nice one. This is a great one for thinking about how important geopolitically Korea is to both China and Japan. This is a map probably most of you guys know, right? This is a map of the Korean War, right? So North Koreans push everybody down to the south. MacArthur lands at Incheon to cut them up and move them up. Chinese intervene and so on. But what's interesting, if you think about the military history of Korea, how these paths look a lot very similar. So here, let's go back to the 16th century when Hideyoshi tries to invade China. A very similar path using Korea uh, going up there with the Chinese coming down. Even more interesting is we get the Russo-Japanese War. We see the, the Japanese coming in, landing in Korea, going up to fight the Russians, right? The Japanese landed in Chon. Right? The same way that MacArthur does, to get into Seoul and go up. So if you're thinking about how important geography, control of the sea is, to the sort of military history of the area, the consciousness of the area, it's something that we tend to overlook. We don't tend to think about this critical role that maritime power and control of Korea can have if you want to be Japan and invade China, or if you want to be China and you want to invade Japan. So kind of the lesson that people were drawing in the sort of the late 19th, early 20th century that sea power is, in, is intrinsic to both maintaining your sovereignty and then also to becoming a rising power. So there's an appeal of Mahan here, right? If you want to be a rising power, you want to control your neighborhood, you want to develop, sea power seems intrinsic to this, which leads to this question of the inevitability of clash. I talked to you guys about sort of the martial Mahan, right? The Mahan that sees like hardwired conflict. And of course, you guys have mentioned the Thucydides trap. Uh, that you guys talked about with Thucydides, is there a view with Mahan of the inevitability of clash of great maritime powers in the long run, or not? I mean, I think that's a debatable point, but it's something you can think about. So Asia's response, right? Western powers, they came from the sea. Western imperialism violated sovereignty. So you need to have some sort of maritime capability to regain sovereignty, to maintain sovereignty, and then to become a great power again. Uh, and the first country that does this is Japan, Imperial Japan. Um, I'll go through that real quick. Again, first Asian state to modernize and become a great power. It's amazing the transformation in Japan. If you think about the 80 year period uh, from the late 19th century to World War II. So the top image I have for you guys is the British uh, bombardment at Kagoshima in 1863, right? So in response to an event on land, the British sail the Royal Navy and they can shell Japanese positions with impunity, right? Gunboat diplomacy. Fast forward to 1942, the Japanese do the Indian ocean raid into the Indian Ocean, right? This is after the fall of Singapore. So the, after the fall of Singapore, the British moved their naval fleet to Sri Lanka and around India. The Japanese raid into the Indian Ocean, inflict losses, and basically chase the Royal Navy to the east coast of Africa. So the, they end the British domination of the Indian Ocean region, which was sort of taken as a given for 200 years. I mean, that's an amazing amount of naval development within such a short period of time for Japan, if you think about it. And of course, J Mahan follows into this as well, right? So Mahan is globally popular during this time period of the late 19th, early 20th century. So as Japan is trying to learn from the West, to modernize, uh, they have people to go and study. And they have their own sort of, I've given you two figures here, sort of Mahanian-ish sort of sea power thinkers in Japan that are actively reading Mahan, engaging with Mahan's ideas. Uh, and of course, you can think about the rise of Japan uh, in these various wars leading up to carving out its own empire in East Asia leading up to World War II. However, there's kind of a debate about what type of influence Mahan has had in Japan. Again, there's a kind of conventional reading uh, about Mahan being very influential in Japan. He, as I mentioned, he visited Japan. He taught Japanese midshipmen uh, in the United States. And there was a period of time where the Japanese Naval Staff College debated inviting Mahan as a visiting lecturer. They ultimately didn't do it. Um, and so, for example, Ron Spector in his book uh, about, about World War II in the Pacific, 
he makes a comment that Japanese officers had inhaled deeply the heady fumes of Mahan, right? That Mahan is sort of a huge influence on the Japanese Navy. And you can see that with some of the, perhaps, the focuses of the Japanese Navy in World War II, the emphasis on the decisive fleet engagement, the emphasis on large surface vessels with big guns, and so on and so forth, uh, if you will. But there's kind of a question of how much influence Mahan actually had. Because if, if you're an aspiring navalist, if you want more money for the Navy, um, does that mean you're influenced by Mahan, or are you more influenced by your own sort of rice bowl bureaucratic interests? And does Mahan, instead of maybe influencing you, merely become a convenient higher authority when you're making the case for a budget? The same way, if you're writing doctrine, it's probably useful to put a couple parts of Clausewitz in there, right? You might not be thinking Clausewitzian, but mentioning fog and friction or the Trinity probably gives you a little bit of intellectual cachet when you're writing your doctrine, not necessarily that you're, uh, you're influenced by them. I would also argue the Japanese vision for sea power was influenced by Mahan, I think, but it also significantly varied from sort of Mahan's vision. Uh, of sea power. Um, I think one of the things to keep in mind here, Mahan is kind of writing for an aspiring global power. Japan was really a regional power and didn't really think about a lot of the larger aspects of Mahan. And one of the interesting blind spots in Japanese naval thinking is thinking about the non-naval aspects of sea power. So very little time was given in Japan to things like commerce protection, uh, protecting commerce, or thinking about commerce interdiction. Uh, in war. Um, there seems to be too much perhaps of a focus on decisive battle. You can even see this in the Russia-Japanese War. The Japanese Navy had a really hard time with the Vladivostok squadron that was interdicting Japanese lines of communications to Korea. Uh, and there's very limited thinking in, in Japan about overseas commerce and the value. You can think about the role of Japanese submarines in World War II was really to attrit U.S. surface vessels, which they ultimately were very unsuccessful in doing compared to other countries thinking about submarine campaigns to strike at commerce and lines of communication, which the United States did quite well against Japan in World War II. So perhaps one could argue there was maybe not enough attention given to the sort of non-naval aspects of Mahan and Japanese naval thought. Um, a couple of other things I can talk about with that. So moving on to contemporary with China and India. So traditionally these are land powers, so perhaps they fit this question that Mahan had when he looked at France, when he was looking at the United States, land powers that had the option to look out to the sea or not. Um, there is also both the history of Western imperialism uh, that sort of changes their historical narrative. And again, for China and India, for most of their history, the invaders came from some other place in Central Asia coming in through the land. Europeans were the first groups that came in from the sea. Moreover, during the post-colonial period, both China and India decide upon mostly having internal development and cutting themselves off from trade. Which again, if you think about it from a Mahanian perspective, right, a Navy's purpose comes out of your commercial shipping and your trade. If you don't have commercial shipping and trade, you're probably not going to have a Navy. Which in case you can see with China and India, not much inferences on maritime affairs when they were trying to have autarkic internal development. Uh, contemporary though, things have changed, right, both of these countries are opened up to international trade. They're both heavily dependent upon external energy imports, and they have a rising interest in maritime security. And of course, kind of a desire for influence or perhaps control over their sea approaches. And so oftentimes you have these writings that you'll see about Chinese or Indian thinking. Are they thinking about, say, the South China Sea? Is the South China Sea China's Caribbean? Right, where it should have a Monroe Doctrine-like control over. Or is, the in, or is the Indian naval officers always like to joke, you know, it's called the Indian Ocean for a reason, right? It's the Indian Ocean, and we should have some degree of control over it the same way the Americans uh, had an idea with the Monroe Doctrine. So what must be done in the most of these countries? One thing, one thing that could be done, again, is developing of the civ civilian maritime industry. You see heavy emphasis and in investment on China, China's part since the 1980s to become a large shipbuilding country and investment in ports and other things. And you have an article and discussions about that tomorrow in your class. Uh, contrasting for India, there's been much less debate and investment in the shipbuilding maritime industry in India. The shipbuilding industry in India, the public one, mostly supplies the naval vessels. It's not really an investment into large-scale shipbuilding, but there's been a debate about that with Modi and the Make in India campaign the past couple of years. 
Increase in naval power, particularly in China's case, after the 1995-96 Taiwan Straits crisis, a lot of interest because there was nothing they could do when the U.S. sent two carrier battle groups. So again, strong investment there. India, you see halting investment since the 1990s in the military capabilities of the Navy. Um, one of the other things that's also interesting is how to increase elite mass support for naval and maritime investment. So increasing maritime awareness, as Mahan would write. So one thing that's been interesting in both countries is they've been trying to fashion a useful maritime past. So if you want to get people to be enthusiastic about the Navy, invest in the Navy, you have to find periods of time in your country's history where the Navy was strong. So as we talk about the rise of the Chinese naval power, rise of Chinese Navy, no surprise that everybody's talking about these Chinese treasure fleets the past 10 or so years, right? The fact that China sent the eunuch admiral into the Indian Ocean in, you know, to explore Africa and so on, that there was a moment in time where China was a naval power, right? Or was a maritime power. So that's emphasized now as a useful aspect of maritime past. You also see a flirting with this in India about the Chola Empire in the south of India, which was a maritime, uh, which was a maritime uh, <coughs> empire as well. A little less emphasis uh, than what China has done the past couple of years. A um, couple of things about Indian thinking, just to give you kind of a taste. I mentioned Panikkar back in the 1940s. His real emphasis was that India needed to control the Indian Ocean region, otherwise it would always be vulnerable to being cut off from trade or to have its sovereignty violated by some other country that had maritime power or maritime control within the Indian Ocean. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite modern day Indian naval thinkers, Admiral Prakash, he really felt that India needs to end what the Indians call maritime blindness, that there's a kind of unwillingness of the political elite in Delhi to consider maritime and naval security seriously and to try and move India to being a more normal power that's more familiar, more adept, more comfortable with the maritime element and in investing uh, in the Navy. Um, you can see sort of where India is thinking about in terms of its area of interest. This was from their last naval uh, doctrine. Thinking about the dark blue here is India's primary area of interest within, with, within Asia and then having secondary interests as well. Naturally, it's very India Ocean, Indian Ocean focused. Uh, you get another map that Indian security concerns and particularly concerns with the entry of China in the Indian Ocean region. Many of you guys have had presentations about strings of pearls and other things and OBAR and other things like that. The Indians are concerned with this growth of Chinese dual use facilities uh, within the region. In terms of China, the focus has been a little bit different and it's been arguably longer and for much longer than it has been in India. So one of the focuses for China has been on this aspect of the two island chains uh, and the need to tr protect trade uh, and protect sort of the maritime approaches uh, to China. Because if you look at China, the, the, the ocean from China's perspective, these island chains seem to box China in, seem to box China's ability to project power out and particularly that the Taiwan situation has not been resolved. That's also something that they're concerned with. But again, having Japan with the alliance with the United States, going up to the islands, then to the Philippines with their alliance, again, it seems that China sort of boxed in, uh, if you will. So there's kind of an idea of how to contest uh, sort of American control of these areas so that China can project power. And again, just another geographic representation of the island chains and thinking about how, the, how China can actively contest U.S. control. And this is all the, the sort of focus we've heard the past couple of years, you know, the anti-access area denial capabilities that the Chinese are working on, uh, if you will. Uh, you can also link this to China and India, right? We've had this past uh, summer, this border standoff that was ended a couple of week, a week or so ago between India and China. So China is not just concerned about the U.S. and its allies, but China and India are also concerned in terms of the maritime realm. This is important because while we tend to put China and India in the same basket, China is a much more powerful actor than India is economically, militarily, by almost any measure. So for the Indians, the maritime domain ostensibly gives them sort of an asymmetric advantage over China uh, compared to say the, the land domain. And so you see arguably a sort of competition between India and China over developing all of this maritime infrastructure in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, China's far ahead of India on this, I would argue. All right, in closing, uh, what I'd just like to kind of wrap up with what I was kind of giving you guys for your taste is trying to introduce you guys to the theories of Mahan, uh, getting you guys to think about different ways of reading Mahan, uh, and then perhaps also the influence Mahan has had in these countries, whether it's, whether it's uh, Japan, India, or China.
Uh, and again, this issue of the role of the government's uh, policy. You know, will India and China, will they stay the course? Will they invest in sea power in a way that perhaps France did not during the time period that Mahan was looking? Uh, or, or, or will they do actually do invest in it the way the United States has been? And sort of what's the, the future? So I, I'll have some time for questions. I'm a little bit under a cold right now, so I'm not as coherent as I normally am. But I'll do my best to pretend to answer questions. I know, don't all jump out at me at once. There's no questions. You guys could leave, but we'll, we'll give you a minute or two. Questions, Mahan, anything? Yeah. Yes? <coughs> Mm -hmm. So what do you think accounts for the fact that China, you know, historically never has a major, or, or just for a very limited time? I mean, I know I've read the stories about the new exploring and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, but then that just went away. What, what do you think accounts for that? Um, you know, the, they, they were not dependent upon maritime trade. And I, mean, I would just echo Mahan. If, you don't, if you're not dependent upon maritime trade, it's more difficult to make an argument for a navy. And so China went out with those treasure fleets looking for trade, looking for engagement. Uh, but ultimately, it didn't amount to, I think, where the investment might be. The investment wouldn't balance the, with the payments, if you will, for the trade. Moreover, I think you also have Mahan's argument. You have a government that was more concerned with both internal security threats and then terrestrial security threats rather than the maritime domain. So it shows, in a sense, that this is not worth it. The investment in the, in the treasure fleet is not worth it for the particular dynasty. And so they, they turned away from the sea as government policy. And that's, I think, really for me, that's where Mahan's main concern is, is that governments can become distracted uh, from the sea because of terrestrial demands. And how do you balance against that?